Walking through the forgotten garden Seems like rain is gonna fall Leaves are dancing gracefully I'm in a peaceful state of mind Thank you.
Good morning and welcome to the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin. We are a spiritual community dedicated to the free and responsible search for truth and meaning and to be in right relationship with one another, with our families and with the planet. We come from a long heritage of teaching that there is a spark of the divine in everyone. And so the way that we normally greet the divine when we come together, even when we are apart and only virtually together, is by greeting the people who are around us. So if you would take a moment, if you have comments, if you are watching this from a platform where you have comments or at a time when you have comments, please do greet one another in those comments. And we're very, very glad you're here. I invite you to join me as we say our chalice lighting words together. This is the flame we hold in our hearts as we strive for justice for everyone. This is the light we shine upon systems of oppression until they are no more. This is the warmth that we share with one another as our struggle becomes our salvation. Black American poet Ross Gay decided to write tiny essays, collecting delights, one a day for a year, and compiled them in his Book of Delights. He wrote, It didn't take me long to learn that the discipline or practice of writing these essays occasioned a kind of delight radar. Or maybe it was more like the development of a delight muscle. Something that implies that the more you study delight, the more delight there is to study. I felt my life to be more full of delight, not without sorrow or fear or pain or loss, but more full of delight. I also learned this year that my delight grows much like love and joy when I share it. This congregation wrote its own mission statement and we revisit it every seven years. We write it on the wall of our sanctuary and we say it together every Sunday to remind ourselves what we're doing here. Together, we nourish souls, transform lives and do justice to build the beloved community.
One of the ways that we do justice as this congregation is that every second Sunday of the month, we have an extra offering, and that offering goes to a second Sunday fund that we then divide amongst 12 organizations that this congregation has voted on. And so you will now hear from a representative of this month's featured organization. Hey everybody, I'm Vic Cornell, longtime member here at First UU and the new director of administration at the Texas Campaign for the Environment. Whenever I tell folks that I'm working at TCE now, they always say, oh, y'all are the ones that knocked on my door. Yep, that's us. Uh, I am privileged to work with the staff most well known for their door-to-door -door organizing. Uh, that has been TCE's core mission ever since the organization was created. It's a key way that we've educated and mobilized people across the state to pressure decision makers to do the right things. And it's how we've recruited the vast majority of our members, like many of you here in the congregation. And then came COVID-19. When we needed to suspend our door-to-door -door organizing, TC rolled up our sleeves and adjusted to our new reality. Now we're organizing by making phone calls and by texting. We're experimenting with new ways to involve our supporters. Your generosity is what makes it possible for our canvassers to do that work. We couldn't continue doing what we've been doing without the support of folks like you. One of the things that we've been doing is pushing back against the take-make-waste economy. That's the unsustainable system that's currently in place where we dig up resources, make unnecessary things, and then waste those things. Um, so one of our areas of focus right now is on the fossil fuel industry, which is the upstream part of Take Make Waste. The problem is that there are only two countries in the world that produce more fossil fuels than the state of Texas, Saudi Arabia and Russia. Our state has allowed drillers to vent and flare climate changing gases at triple the rate of other states. And most of those fossil fuels that we take out of the ground are going to the Gulf Coast to be refined and manufactured into plastics and chemicals. The biggest plastic plant on the planet is currently being built by Exxon and the Saudis in Corpus Christi. 
DC is working with local, state, and national allies to put up a fight the likes of which they have never seen before. We're letting voters know where local candidates stand. We're fighting permits for polluting projects in the coastal bend. We're fighting in city councils and county commissioners' courts. And we're raising a ruckus against the insurance companies and financial institutions that support and back these dirty projects. The battle for the coastal bend is on. Now you can learn more about what we've been working on at texasenvironment.org. Uh, thank you. As always, thank you for your generosity and for your involvement in the struggle. Thank you. Good morning. Today we're going to read a story about a tiny gardener who had a big, bright, beautiful flower in his garden. These are the biggest and brightest flowers in my garden, so I wanted to share them with you. The Little Gardener by Emily Hughes. This was the garden. It didn't look like much, but it meant everything to its gardener. It was his home. It was his supper. It was his joy. Only he wasn't much good at gardening. It wasn't that he didn't work hard. He worked hard, very, very hard. He was just too little. But there was one thing that did blossom in his garden. It was a flower. It was alive and wonderful. It gave the gardener hope and it made him work even harder. He worked all morning. He worked all afternoon. He worked all night. Still, the garden was dying. He would have no home. He would have no supper. He would have no joy. One night, feeling tired and sad, he made a wish. I wish I had a bit of help. No one heard his little voice. But someone saw his flower. It was alive and wonderful. It gave the someone hope. It made the someone want to work harder. The next day, the gardener was weary and slept the whole day. He slept the whole week. He slept the whole month. And when he finally awoke, it had been just long enough for something to change. This is the garden now, and this is its gardener. He doesn't look like much, but he means everything to his garden. The end. John Cage was a white American composer, the leader of the post-World War II avant-garde music movement. His compositions inspired Merce Cunningham's choreography. They were romantic partners for most of their lives. 
It is not futile to do what we do. We wake up with energy and we do something. And we make, of course, failures and we make mistakes, but we sometimes get glimpses of what we might do next. This is the time in our service when we breathe together, when we enter together into an attitude of prayer or a meditation. Maybe we listen or speak to God as we understand God, or maybe we listen to our inner wisdom, or maybe just watch our breath as it goes in and out of our bodies. This is the still point inside where all the religions of the world say that we can receive clarity, where we can feel ourselves rooted in the heart of compassion. Will you breathe with me and enter into the silence together? As we continue in an attitude of meditation, please, you are welcome to light candles in your home, candles of joy or sorrow, candles of memory or hope, or candles of a vow or a determination.
About three years ago, my father fell down a flight of stairs. He was, at 90 years old, carrying a big screen TV down to the basement rec room of their house. His wife, who's a little bit younger than I am, called out, let me help you, let me do that, and he said jovially, nonsense, I'm using physics. And then she heard thump, 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 thump. Broken neck bones, lots of surgeries. I flew up there to visit and sat with them for a week around Thanksgiving that year. They had this, or still have, this sunroom that is filled with jade plants. For years, he's been taking cuttings of jade plants and making new jade plants, and so there's just this forest of jade plants in the sunroom. And the biggest big daddy of the sunroom is a jade plant named Deng Xiaoping. My father was in the news business, so that's the name the jade plant got. And I asked for a cutting from Deng Xiaoping and uh, brought it home to Texas with me, planted it, put it on the windowsill in the kitchen where I could look at it, this tangible connection with my dad. That windowsill didn't have any good light, and so the plant just languished, basically, until I took it outside. I have a raised bed garden that's pretty high, raised up pretty high, and so I put it in there, and it got really sturdy and lots of leaves, and it enjoyed the sun and the fresh air, and all was well. And then he died in May, and I was very glad to have this little piece of him from a plant he'd loved and cared for. I didn't cry much when he died, and I noticed that in myself, and I thought, well, he's 94, but I knew also that grief is a weird little thing, and it hits everybody differently, and it doesn't ever really finish with you. One day, my wife, Kaya, came into the house carrying a pot with just a little stick in it. She said, the chickens ate your jade plant. I felt this rage tsunami sweep up through me. And my heart turned to stone. And I said, those cussed chickens. Only I'm afraid I didn't use the word cussed. They ate every single leaf of my jade plant. Who knew that chickens would eat jade plants? And I was mad at them. And I was mad at me for not knowing that they would also eat my beautiful little sturdy jade plant. And I cried like a child in between threatening to strangle the chickens. But my wife, Kaya, is a gentle person and a gardener, a farmer, and she loves those chickens. <laughs> and she said, I think I can get this plant to come back. And I said, no, I'm not waiting for this plant to come back. Or no, bless your heart. I'm glad you're a hopeful person and everything, but just throw it away. I don't want to see it anymore. We sat on the couch together and talked about giving away the chickens, talked about selling the chickens, talked about trying yet again to surround the garden with something the chickens wouldn't fly over or get into or sneak around or whatever. They'd eaten my flowers. I had beautiful flowers in this one bed that I looked at as I get out of bed every morning, look at the beautiful flowers. Well, they'd eaten those flowers three or four times, and we tried different things to keep them from the flowers. And I was unwilling to try again. Poor thing. One day she suggested that we go to the garden center to get some plants. And I said, no! We're not getting any more plants until we get rid of these stupid chickens. I hate these stupid chickens. They've eaten everything I've ever loved. <laughs> I was in kind of a dramatic mood that day, I guess. 
And so again, we sat on the couch and she held my hand and she knew I was grieving and this is how I was grieving. Well, she'd put the little jade plant out on the porch in the shady sun. And I was ignoring it. But every now and then I'd go out and visit it. I didn't talk to it though. One day she came in and it had these two little, these two little cheerful, insouciant leaves right on the tip of the stem. And I thought, poor dumb little plant. It's trying again. Doesn't it know the dangers that are out there? Doesn't it know what this world is like? How could it grow some more? But I brought it inside and I lined it up on the windowsill away from the chickens inside where they don't come. I lined it up on the windowsill where I'd asked my father's wife to send me some more cuttings and she had, so I had planted those and I have them all in a line and I, I watered it, but I, I didn't give it my heart. I watered it in a kind of a, I don't care way. And then some days later, I, I turned the plant grow light on that we use for the lemon tree in the winter time. And I just thought, okay, here, here's a grow light. I'm gonna water you and give you light and grow if you want to. I've had so many big losses in the garden. I, I had a, a smoke tree that was like another one of my children. And this guy who came into the backyard to cut down another tree that had gotten too much ice damage to live anymore, he cut my smoke tree down too. That was awful. But in addition to losses in the garden, I've had so many smaller just wonders and delights. You know, I moved into a house where the woman before me who owned it had a, was a gardener and she liked to try different plants. And so there were, uh, there were horsetail plants that are the, one of the most ancient plants that there are. I mean, I, I think someone told me that dinosaurs would have recognized the horsetail plant. There's, they're so ancient, they don't even make leaves. It's just a stem. And one day I pushed some grass aside and there was this little clump of miniature Japanese iris, purple and glowing and gorgeous. And sometimes I had surprises in the garden um, just because I didn't know what I was doing because you know I planted beans one year, string beans, and I, I was feeling so brave because I was gonna eat more vegetables and uh, I would go out and check on all my vegetables and all my flowers and the beans just kept having leaves and they never had beans. And I was like, where are the beans? And one day I was weeding and I pushed aside the leaves and underneath the leaves, the beans were, were all there, <laughs> hanging from the bottom of the leaves. So that was a good surprise only because of uh, my, my ignorance. I learned that some flowers will come up a different color the next year than they were the last year. I love this quotation from composer John Cage. We're quoting him a lot today. He said, I am trying to be unfamiliar with what I'm doing. That gives you a certain freedom, doesn't it? Gardens make you think. Gardens make you think, how much do I want it to do what it's going to do? How much do I want to participate in what it's going to do? Am I doing agriculture where I, where I participate a lot and I do, you know, pollinating and grafting and crossbreeding and, or do I just kind of plant something pretty and let it grow wild or do I want to weed that thing out or do I want to leave it because it's drought tolerant or what is a weed anyway? And sometimes something that looks like a weed is, is, really turns out to be useful or beautiful and it seems kind of random what's called a weed and what's called a flower. And maybe you realize working in a garden that there's a balance that you can choose to strike between uh, making nature do what you want it to do and helping it do what it's doing um, and that making it 
wild or making it formal is just a choice and a matter of what you believe about your relationship to the planet and what you think beauty is and what you think water is for. And maybe judging beauty is really just teetering on the edge of a mistake anyway. Another one from John Cage, he says, the first question I ask myself when something doesn't seem to be beautiful is, why do I think it's not beautiful? And very shortly you discover that there is no reason. So what have I learned? <laughs> um, you've learned that I'm not a very good gardener, which is fine, but I am enthusiastic and I love it. I've learned that, I, that you can recover from most mistakes and that you can learn even from the mortal mistakes that you can't recover from. And I've learned that you can experiment and fail and that if you have a living relationship with a living garden, if you're willing to stay in relationship, you can try again and experiment some more and maybe not fail or maybe what does fail mean or maybe what does succeed mean. I learned that I'm happier when I fall in love with the process rather than a goal. And I use that in many places in my life. I don't make goals. I try to make processes. And I've learned that dark is just as important for growth as light. You can't have any growth without dark. And I've learned that sometimes you need to pull up a plant that's not doing well to make room for another one that will thrive, even if you planted that first plant on purpose. From the garden, I learned that I need to ask for help. And I learned that when the world is too full of people and events that outrage my spirit every day, the spirit of life and the spirit of dirt can ground me and keep pushing me through. That's what the spirit of life does. It just keeps making life. And then it pushes you through your life and pushes you to your death because that's how we're made. The spirit of life takes care of death as well. And that's why I cringe a little bit when I read people on Facebook or see a hazy meme that says, oh, I believe in God when I see the dolphins and sunsets, and I think, ah, oh, you don't know much about nature, do you? <laughs> I mean, there are dolphins and there are sunsets, but there's also, you know, blizzards and rats and hyenas and microbes and um, pestilence. I don't say that out loud to people because if they're in a hazy dolphin sunset mood, they don't want to hear any of that. But all of that is right there in your garden. All that creation destruction is right there. And that's how life is built. So how's that little jade stem doing now? I brought it to show you. I hope you can see it. It has a few more little leaves. It might come back all the way.
Before we invite you to participate in our morning offering, I want to give you some news about how our pledge drive is going. It's in full swing right now. And uh, this is the pledge drive that's, that's for um, donations from next January through next December 2021. And I want to thank everybody who has already pledged, and the stewardship team would like to thank you also. We are about two-thirds of the way to our goal. If you've not pledged yet, we ask, she says, they say, that you please pledge generously. And if you've not yet received an email with pledge instructions, please email Shannon at the church office. Her email is Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, at austinuu.org. She can help you. They also are going to have volunteers doing phone banks and calling in the next couple of weekends to assist people who have not yet pledged. And what they want to say, they've asked this very nicely, but I'm going to put it uh, a little more directly. If you are getting calls from someone in this local area code, please do take a chance and answer it because it might be your congregation calling and it is very wearying for the folks who are doing phone banking of one another in this congregation. We ask one another for money. It's not the denomination. It doesn't come from any on high place. We just ask each other. So please try not to dodge each other. And if it's embarrassing to talk about money, I understand. And if you can't give anything, then I will give a dollar a month in your, on your behalf so that you can um, vote in our congregational meetings and so that you can feel a real part of this congregation. So even if you have nothing, I will, I will donate for you. And we, we're all in this together, and you hear that a lot. And um, please be kind and be courageous when it comes to this pledge drive. And now I invite you to participate in the offering, which sustains and strengthens this church along with our pledges. We are very grateful to you for donating, and the information on how to donate is going to be in the comments that uh, are beside the screen that you're watching this service on. Thank you from my heart.
I invite you to join me as we extinguish our chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we hold in our hearts until we are together again. The benediction is from a song written by Kaya Hartwood, my wife, from the words of Dylan Thomas. The force that raises up the flower drives my green age. The force that blasts the roots of trees will soon destroy me and i am dumb to tell and i am dumb to tell and i am dumb to tell the crooked rose go in peace
I changed out of pajamas for this. Really? Two. One more time, that was a pretty good one. If I say so myself. Three. Two. I will scream my smile off at you. Ah. Okay. Three. Two. It stays like this, I realize how big my ears are. I shatnered that one, didn't I? Oh yeah. <laughs>